our movement at first it was led by some deep gyani si mm-hmm. so swami vekanand it was a direct adesh from his great gyani guru uh, shri ramkrishna paramahansa mm-hmm. shri aurobindo we know it comes from the highest so- yeah. places yeah. but suddenly we have leaders in place mm-hmm. who are very far from this uh, center mm-hmm. of what you would call mm-hmm. so that paradox is there in personal life you follow that mm-hmm. but you pursue policy at institutional levels yeah. which actually dehindwise the institution and something that is desacralize the society that is exactly what we mean by civil resistance leadership yeah very sharp intellect a yeah. very productive purpose yeah the ability to blend that with strategy yeah and the outlook to include all dimensions i think this is this is such a you have a template I had to know i had to constantly know mm. why i had to know when i thought about it mm. because the world had to make sense to me mm. it was actually a meaning making process mm. uh, it could be just arbitrary mm. the all the life mm. all the death mm. around me mm. all the pain all the suffering mm. all the pleasure mm. around me all the where is the one where you are <laughs> where, yes all of these questions mm. it all had to make sense if mm. it all had to come together namaskar welcome to both pankaj this has been a long time coming yeah all the conversations that we have we finally decided that it's time to uh, open up uh, those conversations for the world and yeah. hopefully there's some insight and uh, some new kind of perspective that we bring clearly of course we've been talking about uh, the hindu renaissance hindu civilization movement uh, we've also put out our products our uh, perspectives in different formats yeah. uh, ranging from short video series to a series of articles to programs on culture uh but there was one component uh, you know that uh, that probably brought us together that we haven't yet uh, fully explored and uh, this is an opportunity for us to have the dialogue uh, so far right uh the perspective that we look to bring is uh, an intellectual philosophical take on how do we understand the civilization movement how do we uh, trace the origins of whatever we can call the modern hindu uh, thinking uh what are the seminal movements who are the seminal thinkers uh what are the different modes and uh, where are we now and uh, what is the way forward so this series uh, is an attempt to bring all of that uh, of course uh, initially itself when we launched uh, brahat we had uh, bought out the idea of civilizational fire keepers yeah and from that we also uh, articulated uh, and you had you know jotted down the schools of thought that we look up to and uh, that influence our perspective So this is really uh, a conversation that we are having in our living room uh, broadcast for the rest of the yes. week. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially that. Yeah. So it's always uh, you know that's the fun that we have and we're looking to share the fun. Yeah. But uh, it is purposive. Right? Of course while it is natural and free flowing uh, it's very very uh, important dimension to the entire uh, uh, discourse if you will. Because what we are attempting to do very sincerely is uh, try and reflect on our own journey of learning. Yeah. Right? and how did we uh, come about to hold the intellectual and moral convictions that we have today uh, how do we think that we are authentic yeah put it out for scrutiny to the rest of the world yeah hopefully some of it will be uh, informative some of it will be instructive but uh, it should also be provocative it should also uh, curate a learning path for people who are on the journey and we will learn from those journeys right so while you and i are in a dialogue here today but the larger dialogue is with the rest of the public who cares about this and uh, we will put out what we think uh, you know we have learned uh, in this journey and then we will offer that uh, as a service right. so uh, let's start from the from the moment that brought us together right. uh when we trace back our position today and we say that we represent an ideology or we represent an idea we clearly have uh, arrived at that position looking at uh, the history of india let's say in the last 200 300 years apart from of course the entire tradition of knowledge and whatever else uh, is our collective inheritance firstly trace for us what that uh, trajectory has been like how do we situate ourselves in the moment today when you think about hindu civilizational moment what does that mean for you we can start from what are two points in this yeah. what are those movements in which uh, we locate or yeah. how it came to be located for us yeah. as such personally yeah and it has to make sense civilizationally also yeah. because that was always the cause with uh, i believe yeah. with you and yeah. Yeah. with i also yeah. that uh, the personal is always also the universal yeah. and only when they meet then yeah. it comes to make sense yeah. uh 
for me it was uh, it was a moment uh, at first uh, i had an idea of the world when i first grew up politically let's say mm. uh, not real polit- politically but uh, uh, awakened to the history politics and mm. uh, of the world uh, i naturally became a communist mm. and the uh, position of being secular was uh, uh, of mm. course uh, said to be the natural one yeah. even a party which was uh, designated as the evil communalist party bjp its leader at that time alke alke advani and i remember him saying that we are all secular there is nobody who is not secular uh, and at that time i resonated with him who at least is coming down to the secular level which is the uh, normal yeah. for me at that time uh, but uh, that uh, secularism in itself wasn't something which would excite you to a level which uh, makes life interesting it actually it doesn't it doesn't it does it, it, it's a it's a word to use yeah. it's uh, something to pose but beyond that it doesn't inspire you yeah. and uh, beyond anything beyond everything actually i wanted to uh, you know take up all those uh, philanthropic causes yeah. and reasons of how i think or what i think but at the basis of it it had to be interesting yeah. life had to be interesting whatever cause i would take up had to be interesting and i found at that time communism to be interesting yeah. because it had an ideology which first of all extremely simplified the world yeah. in a few slogans yeah. in a few phrases yeah. you didn't have to read much yeah. although there are too many books yeah and i was uh, i was a reader i constantly would read but it was very easy to take up that cause and I really be by reach it yeah it is very strategic that there yeah. is still to uh, the to, entire canon canon to just 25 to 30 phrases that's yeah. their strength also when a movement when an, an ideology becomes a worldwide movement yeah that's what they do yeah being able to distill it in 20 to 25 phrases yeah so i was that when i was 18 yeah. when i stumbled upon <laughs> uh, the greatness of my guru Uh, at his lotus feet i was landed just by sheer coincidence and it was basically he who turned me towards uh, all of this yeah. and uh, the first book i remember he gave me was sitaram goel it was a particularly at that time what i would uh, think as an acerbic book yeah. the title was jesus christ and artists for aggression i found the title very aggressive itself and i started reading it so <laughs> Huh? You're soft hearted. <laughs> you drank till us. Uh at that time I imagined myself uh, imagined yeah. Yeah, yeah, I imagined myself in that. Because you know that image goes with philanthropy and uh, being able to do good to the world. The same image. I reveled in that all the time. <laughs> so uh, that book I I read to you know I thought that I will just uh, dispel the notions whatever this man has to say because I have a better understanding of the world. the story is that uh, he ended up convincing me of whatever he wrote because that was rationally logically he saw so uh, my guru gave me all of these books especially introduced me to sitaram ji sri ram sri ji but also essentially reintroduced me to the works and thoughts of the greats like swami vekan sri aurobindo and at what moment it started changing so basically when it starts changing is that when swami vekanand essentially mm. not just in india but goes abroad mm. and in an atmosphere we can't even imagine today we might reflect on that speech and find it deficient in some cases yeah all those endeavors yeah but in a universe with pitch dark yeah atmosphere for hindus yeah. where we were just thought of as snake charmers and completely superstitious people yeah. nothing else nothing more he goes there and he lights up the world yeah. through hindu wisdom so that is a moment which actually in contemporary era redefines our own civilizational identity mm. hindu dharm mm. sanatan dharm and hindu society and it kindles a desire to have an identity yeah. at a very deep level yeah. and then you understand the importance of identity why is that seminal moment mm. why is it so important yeah. when swami vivekanand goes yeah. and becomes different it is an exercise supreme exercise in being different yeah he goes there and tells that we are different and we are not ashamed of it actually we are proud of it yeah so that rekindling of desire to have a very strong identity mm. not because you should have mm. but because we have mm. a very strong identity mm. very deep roots in our culture in our civilization mm. that is a very defining moment mm. which is then re- rekindles the entire mm. which then leads you to another thing that if he was working in pitch darkness mm. it means that there was darkness mm. and there must not always be darkness because we were uh, not one of the greatest civilizations at most of human history regarded history we were the greatest civilization mm. anywhere in the world yeah. and this is not being chauvinistic or not being i uh, i don't like to exaggerate in that way yeah. but uh, we were yeah. 
So something went wrong. Yeah. So actually, just this one civilizational movement of Swami Vivekananda going there, rekindling that desire, yeah. it leads us on to so many quests. Yeah. What is that quest? Yeah. That first of all, we were very great. Yeah. Then something happened, yeah. internal or external, yeah. which plunged us into dark. Yeah. Then this man comes yeah. up yeah. and he rekindles that desire to have a very strong identity yeah. of us, yeah. of Swayam Yeah. And, and he looked at the tradition of long gurus who've done it exactly. all through history. Exactly. Yeah. He is reaffirming tradition. Yeah. So he tells us that we are not dead. Yeah. This is not, I'm not reinventing anything. Yeah. I'm not imagining anything new yeah. basically the Guru Shisha Parampara yeah. the tradition yeah. the continuous eternal living tradition which yeah. flows yeah. through every generation yeah. has been kept alive yeah. Yeah. just not in front of uh, you know uh, entire world yeah. but it has been kept alive yeah. and he through the grace of his great Gyani Guru yeah. Sri Ram Krishna Param is uh, trying to rekindle it again yeah. so it leads us on to so many paths yeah. just this one civilization movement so that's, you know, as far as our recent uh, uh, Hindu history uh, can be yeah. considered, that is the that is the starting point. Yeah, right? that we is can consider that to be very firm. the uh, Samana movement. And that's why even in the uh, schools of thought, yeah. uh, our first attempt was you to start with, uh, we trace yeah. from there. Yeah. So what are the contours after that? What happened, uh, you know, ever since that uh, uh, great day yeah. uh, in 1893? What was, what followed? After that, Swami Vivekananda was, of course, not the only one. Yeah. And uh, he was one of the great, still one of the greatest saints. But after that, a lot of great saints in different, different disciplines pick it up. For example, there is Swami Dayan, who for the first time wakes up, says that enough is enough uh, to Christian critics of Hindu dharma and Hindu society and Hindu uh, religious practices, customs and rituals. And he says that enough is enough. And uh, it is our right also to look at you from our prison, yeah. from a Hindu point of view. Yeah. He reverses the case yeah. and he's a great intellectual. Yeah. He's someone who can get down on a desk yeah. and, you know, uh, go through all the texts. Yeah. And he went through the Bible, he went through the Quran yeah. and reversed the case on them, yeah. put them into a light, deconstructed, uh, deconstructed that from within. Yeah. So he does this great work, but uh, there is an element to his work that it's, it's a supreme exercise in rationality and logic. Very beautiful. If you read his work, it's very rational, very logical. And if you would read a lot of his scholars in the West, in Europe itself, when uh, Europe was waking up uh, during the Enlightenment, uh, when well, the rationalist endeavor was uh, being fronted in their civilization and was becoming the main vehicle of their civilization, you see a lot of scholars actually doing the same to Christianity and to their own texts. Mm -hmm. So you can see a similarity in Swami Dhanan and those scholars. There's something missing in that approach. Mm -hmm. What uh, that uh, uh, that missing element is uh, the absence of a deeply spiritual cosmology, mm -hmm. point of view, yogic way of thinking, so to say. So that is there. But Swami Vivekananda, uh, Swami Dayanand inevitably contributed a lot to our attitude mm -hmm. that we became proud that we can actually critic uh, the other, those who have been ruling us. We can critic them. Mm -hmm. Their inspiration, their religious inspiration, very very well. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of great thinkers come mm. uh, who were also activists. For example, uh, great uh, Lala Raj, uh, Lajpat Rai Ji mm. and uh, uh, more than him actually, uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilanji, mm. who was also a great thinker. Uh, the trio, yeah. Yeah. And the trio, Bal Gangadhar Tilak was also a deep thinker, yeah. great thinker. And it, it was a rarity. He was a great Polymath. activist too, also. Polymath in many disciplines, yeah. also very much active on yeah. ground. Yeah. So that's a rare quality. And he brings up, he also does a lot of work. He reverses the gaze also. Uh, relocates a lot of our disciplines in English language also and in more uh, modern contemporary idioms and phrases. But actually after Swami Vivekananda, uh, another saint mm. who relocates it very, very firmly into our tradition is, and you would know more about him than mm. uh, I would, is uh, Sri Aurobindo. Mm. Uh, Sri Aurobindo is uh, just like Bal Gangadhar Tilak. He is a great activist. He yeah. is very much yeah. deeply he involved in politics. Yeah. Yes. Militant politics. Militant politics. Yeah. And he he never shied away yeah. from that. Yeah. So not just politics, but uh, yeah. anything that you need to do to achieve your goal yeah. is what uh, his way. Yeah. And he is very much into that, into activism. At the same time, he has a great intellectual uh, side to it. He is a great reader. He is a great writer. At the same time, he is a big East also mm. because uh, he created some of the 
uh, greatest, most beautiful poems in English language uh, coming in contemporary India. Mm. And then after that, he's very deep into spiritual practice. Mm. And that's where he's very firmly into the Rishi tradition of mm. uh, Bharatvarsh. Whether some would, would try to call him a Rishi or not, that's another moot point. But uh, what uh, our attitude is, is that he was, he was, yeah. he was, he was a Darshta at that level. So he, what he does is, uh, even he takes one step more than Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, they were adding a lot to what uh, Swami Vivekananda did. But in, uh, I don't see them exceeding mm. uh, the range of Swami Vivekananda. Mm. But Sri Aurobindo, because he was intellectual, he was aesthetic, he was an activist, mm. and he was a great spiritual mm. practitioner. In that, he actually exceeds. Mm. Yeah, in some ways, mm. what even Swami Vivekananda did. And he creates an entire new paradigm. He plays with the new. Mm. That's why a lot of uh, uh, some people in some uh, you know groups uh, inside uh, the Hindu movement would not uh, uh, do not cozy up to him and mm. his work very much. Mm. Because he played with the new. He didn't shy away from the new. But at the same time, he was very much from the tradition. Mm. So that is another great step uh, uh, that uh, our movement takes. I think you would uh, uh, you would have something much better to say about Sri Aurobindo than I would. <laughs> yeah. Can't uh, say much better, but uh, personal inspiration for sure. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think to offer a critique of such high quality of the Western civilization from a cultural point of view, when you read Foundations of Indian Culture, yeah. the ability to look at the Western world the way they would describe it to themselves and then show the hollowness of that. And to do that when you still be captured and then you're still uh, ruled, uh, but I think the most fascinating part is the journey from that brilliant political mind, the brilliant activist, to uh, to the spiritual work, to the sadhana that he has done, uh, to actually herald not just uh, not just the new in that time, but I think he is the ever new. Yeah. In the sense that I don't think we've seen the descent that Sri Aurobindo was working on even today, the descent of consciousness. He was preparing the planet and all of humanity. To actually become eligible to descend that, to be capable of holding that. Yeah. Right? And I think, uh, uh, at least intuitively, whatever I gather, uh, it appears that uh, the time that he was foreseeing uh, is beginning to dawn upon us now. I, I have a, a very strong hunch that uh, he was preparing us for what you and I are experiencing today. Yeah. Right? So definitely he was, I would uh, agree with her. No. Comparison itself is a uh, is an exercise in uh, frailty in this, but when we trace the big moments in civilization in the last 150 years, 200 years, these two stand out because right? yeah. the uh, the charge that they've given is what we draw from even today. Yeah. So yeah, clearly I think that's uh, and that is why even in our schools of thought, uh, you know, Sri Aurobindo's school of thought uh, of uh, Bhavani uh, Bharati follows Sri Aurobindo's uh, school of Hindu Renaissance. So how do we look at the uh, the evolution post Aurobindo? Yeah. So uh, after uh, Sri Aurobindo, there is a great gap because we know that Sri Aurobindo came later, much later than Swami Vivekananda. He started independence movement. He lived much beyond that. Uh, some say, although I would not uh, love to use that word, that he receded into uh, the spiritual ray. Uh, from a Hindu point of view, that's not a recession. That, that is the supreme ascent. Yeah. <laughs> that, so he he created great work there, uh, and he sat through entire independence movements. So he lived uh, far beyond that. Mm. But what happened is that uh, the political arena at that time was taken over by some extremely different personality, and we know we are all privy to that. Mm. That the rise of uh, actually Mahatma Gandhi, mm. who was great in his own terms in many many ways. But uh, it was a rise of uh, mainly political and cultural, socio-cultural consciousness, yeah. which did not uh, do very much with spiritual praxis that we have. Yeah. It uh, talked in some terms, some phraseology, mm. which is common to every Hindu, mm. which uh, actually a lot of Westerners or uh, outsiders also are put off with uh, mm. that Hindus throw these mm. spiritual terms uh, mm. uh, too often. Mm. And uh, so that spiritual terminology was there. Mm. But we see a great shift mm. during that time. Mm. The rise of Congress mm. at that time, the uh, constitution of RSS also in 1925, mm. the rise of Congress before that, and the rise of Mahatma Gandhi to political arena. Mm. A personality who goes by the title of Mahatma embedded within the name, doing things which are extremely political mm. and fronting that mm. 
and uh, his disciples as we know Jawaharlal Nehru yeah so that was a very different shift in our consciousness our movement at first it was led by some deep gyani sir mm-hmm. so Swami Vivekanand it was a direct adesh from his great gyani guru uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa yeah. Sri Aurobindo we know it comes from the highest of yeah. places yeah but suddenly we have leaders in place mm-hmm. who are very far from this uh, center mm-hmm. of what you would call sanatan dharma mm-hmm. which is uh, which is where gyani's jeevan mukti Uh, these uh, atma these realized souls inhabit and this is a world which is extremely different mm. what happened in political arena mm. was that uh, during the run up to the independence mm. a call was set mm. a call of unity mm. uh, a call of because there was this uh, prospect of elections and yeah. democracy yeah. and for that you needed to take uh, all populations all communities together mm. and at that time 25 to 30% of course had mm. become in this uh, undivided india mm. they were uh, muslims mm. and so there was uh, this great need mm. by political parties for a political system mm. to send a call of unity mm. as soon as that call was sent whatever swami vekananda and sri arvindo carry suddenly became irrelevant mm. irrelevant in the sense because muslims felt and muslim leadership at that time of course, at least felt very offended mm. by whatever saw awaken and carry because they were quintessentially very deeply hindu sadhus mm. who were leading and that's how our uh, society and our culture no, organization is yeah. it's always led by gyanis yeah. and sadhus yeah uh, i would not even say brahmins in this case because even yeah. above brahmins there are jivan mukhs yeah. there are these these gyanis yeah. who lead this uh, yeah. I, it was led by the greats like this yeah. but suddenly uh, there is a shift mm. and uh, this call for unity is sent and uh, uh, muslim leadership is offended by the deep hindu mm. uh, religious hindu dharmic core mm. of uh, the independence movement mm. and uh, so congress leadership decides mm. at that time political leadership uh, whatever was in the country it decides except hindu mahasabha or mm. few other political parties that's a political party matter it's mm. different mm. but most of the influential leadership uh, in congress they decide that even uh, the conservatives within congress within congress yeah. they decide that to a very significant extent the independence struggle had to be de-hinduized mm. and by that of course it has to be de-indianized in mm. many ways we know the objections to vande matram yeah we know all that have yeah. for the sake of that unity mm. actually they said that we have to create a common platform on which muslims would also come mm. for that you had to de-hinduize the entire movement, mm. remove every single hindu element mm. and the ridiculous position that uh, we Uh, Hindu uh, Hindus as a society found themselves in is that we created a platform mm. which we thought of as a common platform. We uh, abandoned and removed every single cultural civilization sign mm. and symbol mm. that mm. we carry. We got onto that platform mm. and we still found that we were there alone. The other side never got onto it because of whom we actually de-Hinduized and uh, de-cultured yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So a very neutral, which is. there is nothing neutral even in matters cultural and civilization yeah. it's a way to delude uh, yeah. a majority yeah. so we were disavowed this was there even if you follow the constant assembly debates yeah. there were conservative thinkers there no. were traditional yes. thinkers the politics was still to a large extent uh, influenced by people who were rooted in civilization yes. Yes. but they did perhaps have the leadership position yes this paradox you see even in indian politics today for example you see uh, the politics of tamil nadu yeah. and you see the ruling very anti hindu party dmk and if you see the their yeah. uh, their personal lives yeah. yeah the lives of the uh, yeah. the wife of the chief minister who is currently ruling tamil nadu yeah. and you see that they will worship uh, they will do even go puja yeah. they will go to temples and do those uh, everything that uh, in their view yeah. politically what they see is very superstitious things they do yeah. Uh, Siddharamaiah in Karnataka yeah. that he would invite uh, you know uh, magicians to yeah. ward off evil and all of yeah. that even in his car and all yeah. so that paradox is there in personal life you follow that mm. but you pursue policy at institutional levels yeah. which actually de-hinduize the institution and subsequently desacralize the society yeah. which is what these stalwarts of the uh, Congress party failed to see yeah. there were so many greats in fact if you see because that was a great time you were yeah. struggling who many great what to poor it was there was a great moral yeah you see km munshi yeah. you see c rajgopalachari you see rajan prasad yeah. you see sardar patel great great personalities yeah. that come only in extremely difficult times yeah very just like uh, uh, great uh, saints in personal life yeah. uh, in their very spartan lifestyle yeah. uh, full of sacrifice and all yeah. but they failed to see yeah. that what they were exceeding to yeah 
in their attempt to accommodate someone who is who cannot be accommodated they were actually setting in motion a great process which will de-hinduize desacralize our tradition yeah. de-hinduize the country uh, make our institutions neutral and actually ready to be taken over by a militant minority important. yeah yeah yeah, yeah that class this is very important because uh, unless you reflect on this deeply you will not understand the historical roots of your current predicament yes right? yes these seeds of the schizophrenia yes. were sown there yes. but you will have to take that idea along with the conviction that your indian freedom movement was a moral one yes. that the indian state is a moral state yes. this is uh, you know this is something where you talk to young people today yes. there is this angst when you you know obviously when you are suddenly awakened to the reality and what yes. you've been denied there is also a tendency to throw away uh, what is moral and what is truly ours yeah. along with uh, the things that are uh, obviously uh, not correct yeah. so i think this mental process and this ability to cognitively balance both these uh, perspectives yeah. that true the seeds of the schizophrenic existence that we have today were sown at the inception uh, during independence because of a certain kind of leadership but at the same time it does not start the entire indian freedom movement the indian freedom movement is a great historical achievement yeah. and the indian state that has you know that is a result of that is a moral and the essential force yeah. to even get back to the hindu civilizational view that we want yeah. so would you agree with that was is there any other perspective on that, that no no independence was absolutely crucial the run up to the independence and the core of that yeah. movement yeah. was very deeply spiritual yeah what happened over time they make a single mistake yeah. of trying to accommodate the side which cannot be accommodated. Yeah. and with that single single fault yeah. which is so singular yeah. which is so important that actually a lot of uh, mistakes yeah. creep in yeah. in that movement yeah. so what happens is that uh, they set in all of this movement we agree to partition and uh, i'm not debating whether the partition it's a very different question should have been there should have been not but it was obviously on religious lines and yet we do is that we give them uh, now yeah. uh, uh, retrospectively two countries and uh, we don't uh, complete the partition and yeah. creating the actually exacerbating the problem actually within india yeah. whatever is left of india yeah. even now so that uh, a great uh, trajectory was set in motion at yeah. that time yeah. and there were was a series of unfortunate incidents for example sardar patel doesn't live yeah uh, long enough you yeah. know within one year one and a half year he yeah. passes away yeah. subhash chand bose is completely you know, eliminated from the scene yeah uh, Hindu Mahasabha because of the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi yeah. actually the second Hindu poll yeah. becomes completely redundant and then ridiculous yeah. because they were pushed to ridiculous extremes yeah. so now they are after that their presence in politics becomes comical yeah. uh, rather than any meaningful uh, you know contribution to it yeah. they were a great uh, poll yeah. before that before the assassination of Gandhi yeah. but they are rendered meaningless yeah. how do you look at Ramraj Parishad and uh, Swami Dattatre ji uh, this they they very much oriented to yeah. their own tapas yeah uh, the whatever they were trying to do with great personal tapas great personal tapas they were trying to orient it yeah. and trying to bring back things to tradition what in my view that uh, they actually didn't foresee is that they had to speak the language of the times in order to create a bridge yeah. with the population that had already been deracinated yeah. and uh, it was a new political setup, setup. yeah and, new and political and we, were, uh, we were actually taken in yeah by the language of uh, politics at that time. yes yeah. at that yeah. time but the, the reality was that that ever since uh, industrial revolution was crashed into india mm. by the british empire mm. by the british raj you had created a great pool of population which no longer understood the terminology the physiology that the traditional folks were used to speak and uh, as unfortunate as that was you had to create a bridge that bridge got lost also because of the uh, some misunderstandings on the other side also yeah. not just on this side yeah. uh, uh some uh, i would say arrogance some yeah. uh, unwillingness and some pride in political power and yeah. the power of the institutions yeah and not to paying enough attention towards the traditional folks who had been carrying the tradition like uh, yeah. uh, great swami ka patri ji all yeah. the ages that was also there but there was also the lack of uh, understanding at this side that you have to create bridge yeah with the population yeah. Uh, yeah which has gone far from you yeah. you cannot say that uh, they are lost we have to gain on back under that pr- yes and the transformation has to be factored it has to be factored yeah. so uh, that happened and uh, 
uh, I think that's critical even today when we yeah. talk about the intellectual churn that's happening in India today. Yeah. Yeah. I think the debate still centered around that. Yeah, it's still centered. You might give it new nomenclature. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. this uh, uh, this tendency to box yourself yeah. and not have enough cognitive and attitudinal intelligence yeah. to know how to position yourself in a certain context. Yeah. Uh, you know, and because the whole idea of our conversation is is to reflect on how we look at things, yeah. right? And 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 there are great pitfalls yeah. and they're great uh, dangers, yeah. especially now because. It's so easy to get cancelled. Yeah. And when you attach your identity, you put all your vulnerability with it. Yeah. Right? So the idea is how do you help a young mind yeah. come through unscathed yes. and still have a purpose. Yeah. The idea is to be functional. Yeah. Right? Uh, you can read history for all the intellectual amusement, yeah. but the uh, it doesn't really lead to anything unless you are productive. The tradition has to be living. Like yeah, if they're functional. Yeah. Functional means that it has to be living. Yeah. Anything which is not living is not tradition. That anything, is not tradition. Uh, any, anything which is not that it is not Sanatan or Hindu because Sanatan, the very word says, it has to be eternal, it has to continue. Ever new. Ever new. Yeah. Ever new and ever that uh, carrying that same universal principles also. Yeah. So that which always is. Yeah. That's why it's not old. Yeah. It's not new. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's that which always is. And it has to be living. Yeah. It has to be functional, just like you said. So that understanding always and your particular focus is also to yeah. so speak in a language which even those yeah. who have gone far from uh, our cultural chitta bhumi. Yeah. Even they can understand. We have to create bridges. We need to appeal to their moral core. Yes. yes, because we are. You haven't designed institutions, and it is. It should not be too hard to empathize because we've come from the same education. System. Yes, as we know that this return back home, at least for me. Yeah. You know, you met your guru at uh, eighteen, nineteen. Uh, my uh, uh, whatever you can call it, my awakening to our historical truth uh, or our cultural truth. Uh, was after a long time uh, you know, uh, working as any other. Yeah. Right? So you you approach it from a point of your own journey. And because of my own history, I know it was only because I met a guru who was so scintillatingly brilliant yeah. and so forceful yeah. and with a righteous aggression in his yeah. all that yeah. he did yeah. that he could cow down yeah. a, a belligerent yeah. like me yeah. who was came with all those stupid but very deep uh, yeah. in a way uh, very fundamental questions yeah. um, asked in a position of anger. Yeah. Anger at whatever the world was, whatever yeah. the state of affairs yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, but if it had been anybody else, yeah. I don't know what would have happened to me or how long I would have taken him. Yeah. So to take a position of, uh, you know, yeah. uh, a high position and say that these youngsters, they do not understand and they are this and that, all that is a statement of fact. Yeah. The Anyone who wants to work with them will yeah. have a different approach, yeah. just like you. It's not a responsibility. It's yeah, it is a responsibility. Yeah. So, uh, that is, uh, yeah. You know, just, just going back to, uh, you know, capturing what you mentioned. Right? So, we know that uh, the spiritual seed and the spiritual core which guided the movement got diluted, got diluted. with the rise of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, that is perhaps the first time that the political started taking over the, the cultural and civilization. civilization. And I think that also uh, uh, reflected back to the Hindu movement as well. Yeah. Because they saw that the power and the public opinion was galvanized towards the political. I think uh, even uh, the institutions and the organizations that were yeah. uh, that were positioning themselves to be the cultural uh, uh, gatekeepers yeah. also had to tackle yeah. Uh, yeah. that public uh, sway. Right? Yeah. I think uh, that diluted uh, uh, in their own understanding. Some of the principles, uh, you know, on which Sanatan Dharma stands. Exactly. And from there, of course, you had an entire secular history, and many writers have written about it. And we can easily look back at that time and see how it has affected our psyche even today. Yeah. Right? So, what are the uh, missing points if you were to trace from, let's say, 1950s to uh, currently? I want us to get to the present. Yeah. What? How do we map the yeah. sports landscape today? Yeah. Right? Uh, how do we? So, very important point you mentioned. You mentioned about uh, uh, we were talking about the assassination of Gandhi. Yeah. And how through that Hindu Mahasabha was relegated to yeah. a, almost a comical position. And then after the elimination of one after another, yes. even the greats who had occupied a stage after it had been vacated by our saints like Sri Aurobindo, yes. like Mahatma Gandhi, Sardar Patel, Subhashan Bose, all of them are eliminated in quick succession yes. one after another. Yes. And just like uh, almost mirroring what happened in uh, Soviet Union, mm -hmm. that Lenin was sent to uh, as a German yeah. uh, spy to yeah. Russia, yeah. 
so that he would play the german side yeah. but after that happens is that germany loses yeah. he gets entire uh, russia and then he dies suddenly yeah. yeah within a few years yeah. and stalin who had just 10 years ago would have no chance of ruling even a small uh, you know block yeah. he comes to rule the largest country on earth and in many ways actually jawaharlal nehru when you see uh, the political scene in 1930 yeah. he is an extremely small in the greater scheme of things yeah. a very small player yeah. but then suddenly through successive elimination and i am not uh, lending to any conspiracy theory there was no conspiracy in this at least yeah. in the ascension of uh, nehru to this yeah but uh, just by the sheer time yeah. yeah it was the flavor of those times yeah. and even if there is a conspiracy it yeah. is and the view is that it is it yeah. was the stars yeah. that uh, which made it this way so after quick succession nehru comes to power yeah. and we all know uh, sitaram ji has written very well that yeah. he was a uh, he just didn't carry the party card yeah. he was a very convicted communist yeah. we all know his love for china yeah. love for soviet union love for all communist ideas yeah. he was a very extremely dedicated him very committed communist very committed communist yeah. who just short of shy, because he was also a very spoiled uh, aristocrat yeah. in that sense yeah. so he shied away from just creating a communist country yeah. institutionally but otherwise he put in a lot of communist ideology in motion through that political takeover of india uh, a party like that which had now completely in the hands of uh, jawaharlal nehru and then later on his uh, family uh, which you indicated yeah. that the other side which uh, picked up the cultural flag yeah. which is rss and other organizations mainly uh, the sun they also started thinking mainly in political because they had to also nehru persecuted them directly yeah. Yeah. very much yeah. so and also they had to factor in those realities yeah. they were impressed also in some ways yeah. by the success of a paradigm which was mostly overtly political yeah. even communist so they mirrored all if you see yeah. the history of uh, san parvar also yeah. they have been mirroring yeah. those who are in power yeah. try to create institutions and blocks within their uh, yeah. uh, organization which mirrors uh, mm. uh, the structurally mirrors yes, structurally the political side so, so the moral core is completely different yeah moral core is very different uh, the school of traditional cause absolutely the ability to sacrifice yes uh, that uh, yes. that values is very and it touch with reality yeah. because they work on ground yeah. and uh, that's where they rise they rise from bottom up they do not descend from above yeah so in that case they have that touch with reality yeah. but because of all these circumstances yeah Uh, there you can very clearly see a shift from cultural and spiritual yeah. towards what is political and uh, social in that yes, i think that leads us to a very good uh, way to organize our own thinking uh, if you are a young person standing uh, starting out to think about civilization today uh, you need a social perspective you really need to understand what are the social structures in india what is the impact of industrialization yeah. like you mentioned along that because without that the vocabulary does not land that is the uh, soil that makes it correct you need to know the political landscape and the political history uh, you need to know the strategic landscape you also need to know the spiritual landscape of india because otherwise you don't really have an idea of the civilization itself yeah. right and what we are seeing here is the ascent of the political and the even with the value orientation value orientation is a personal value orientation but there is a civilizational value orientation that can only come from a spiritual and cultural understanding yeah. and that has been subsumed under the political understanding yeah. and therefore you have a value orientation without an intellectual edge yes because your intellect also is shaped by the spiritual vision so if you're looking at a complete multidisciplinary civilizational thinker today yeah. and if you're talking about civilizational leadership which is what we say is our pillar at uh, it is that you need to have all these dimensions yeah. you need to be a well-rounded person to be productive in this but with a deep understanding of all this that yeah. so i'm trying to bring it back to you know how one can mold oneself yeah what is the responsibility that you subscribe to once you say we are speaking on a civilization yes yeah. so you see this uh, the all these trends that you just mentioned uh, setting it and creating institutions by yeah. for example another extremely momentous thing which happened to us yeah. as that we copy the british constitution in many ways of course with some cosmetic surgery on that according to the conditions and communities that are in india but we come up with a document and i'm not talking of any particular because i'm obviously not an expert of the constitution mm. but uh, the basic nature as the great mimi khan is said mm. that the problem is not with particular articles of the constitution mm. the problem is with the complete orientation spirit the spirit of the constitution which works on the narrative of rights and not duties mm. so of course there are some perfunctory duties that are mentioned in the constitution 
but they don't define the duties for individuals and communities at different levels which is fundamentally the way in which a hindu universe hindu cosmology hindu society is built upon my duty creates your right and that interdependence creates this cohesion cohesion yes. exactly that's a beautiful way to put it yes. that rights are preserved yes. by duties yes. by playing your duties you preserve rights yes. and we move fundamentally away from that along with constitution of course uh, the entire democratic setup election yes. Uh, adult franchisee, all the ideas which were created in enlightenment, we copy them, lock, stock, and barrel on our society. Yeah. And at that time, because the democracy was in deep, uh, which was the lament, but mm -hmm. the, in uh, retrospect, you see mm -hmm. uh, that it was not such a bad thing. At that time, it was not very deep, but the effect of that mm -hmm. uh, process which was set in motion, mm -hmm. we can see now mm -hmm. that how institutions built on principles which are not generated from your cultural spiritual paradigm. Mm -hmm. When they are imposed on our society, mm -hmm. they back impose and back generate yeah. the problems yeah. that are not ours, yeah. that are from an alien uh, land and alien chitta bhumi, yeah. and then they create those same problems within our society. Yeah. You import the problems. You import the problem. You invent the pro by importing the institution. You actually invent the problems in your society. Apart from you know, not solving what was already there, yes, yes. you actually you access it. Yeah. You ignore those problems yeah. and access it with them. So this is also a false error. A false error, yeah. which is what I mean, I look at uh, some of the recent cases in Supreme Court. Yeah, we wonder how did this become a policy issue? Yeah. Why is this a big issue in India today? Yeah, right? and it doesn't make any sense in a, yeah. in a public public discourse. Yeah. What why this? But it is happening. It is happening. Because that's the institutional power that is there. And we are wondering why with a different party, yeah. which everyone world over keeps yeah. saying it's a very, it's a fundamental, you know, a radical change in our quality in yeah. our consciousness of uh, India, that we are amending our right. democratic, uh, you know, fundamentals and all. Even despite that, we see that the line of the arrow yeah. of progression yeah. in our cultural history, yeah. if you see from independence, once those institutions are in, yeah. there is not even a single dip in that uh, arrow. Physiology, that's any is uh, in place. It is going in a certain direction. It's yeah. not a stopping. Yeah. Not waiting for any political party or any great polit political leader. Yeah, it's proceeding as it was. Yeah. under any other party. Yeah. So this makes us think that uh, uh, these institutions and where they come from are very important. Yeah. So uh, bringing that history to yeah. uh, our schools of thought again, this becomes the norm. Mm. We create institutions which are uh, very secular, very not real secular, but in many ways also deeply anti-Hindu or at least non-Hindu mm. and uh, uh, communist in orientation, mm. many of the institutions and many of the policies of the government. Mm. And we run that ship for uh, around 40 to 45 years mm. until the collapse of Soviet Union mm. uh, there in Moscow, mm. which uh, leads to uh, the collapse of many mm. things in India also, uh, which uh, uh, brought in a lot of social yeah. economic changes in India, of course, with the opening of Mm -hmm. everything. Uh, but things were not as quiet because India is never about Nepal very beautifully says a mm. million mutinies yeah. and if you see India at any point of time yeah. actually I'm surprised he took that much time to come up with the title yeah. it, it comes later in his it's the third book in his trilogy yeah. in India it should come up uh, with it first yeah. because India is always a million mutinies. Yeah. so while this was happening yeah. uh, and while we see we are talking about all of this time in this uh, talk itself we are talking about how that uh, flame that yeah. was kindled by Saul Vekan and, and then Sri Aurobindo, yeah. then it gets uh, snuffed in a way yeah. uh, with the call for unity by Congress and these political leaders. Yeah. The political ascents become supreme. Yeah. But at the same time, Ram Saroop born in 1920, yeah. Sri Sita Ram Goyalji born in 1921, yeah. they are coming of age while India is becoming independent. Right. And they, with nobody knowing about them yeah. at that time, yeah. Yeah. virtually few maybe just hundreds of individuals yeah. knowing about them. They are working with all of this. Yeah. They are working in a tradition yeah. which is directly traced to Sherwindo. And, and that is not well known. That is not well known. That is amazing to Sri Aurobindo. That's why it is very important to yeah. trace. Yeah. That there is a direct link in connection. Uh, so our next great uh, uh, firekeeper of civilization after yeah. Sri Swami Ekanand and Sri Aurobindo is Sri Rao Saruchi, yeah. uh, who wrote in Voice of India, yeah. along with him, Sri Sita Ramji, who yeah. created, founded uh, Voice of India publications. Yeah. So, Sri Rao Saruchi is uh, the next great thinker yeah. of the century. Yeah. And actually, one of the greatest, you can say, along with Swami Kanas and Sri Aurobindo, one of the greatest thinkers yeah. that is contemporary yeah. times. Yeah. So, he was simmering yeah. on low heat. Yeah. His ideas were simmering on low heat yeah. all this well. Yeah. 
when the moment for ram janmabhoomi comes yeah and the hindu chitti of uh, you know yeah. the nation actually suddenly kicks up yeah he brings in all the perspective about us yeah. and about what we are not about who we are and how yeah. we are not and brings it up fronts it all in a span of just around 1000 to 1200 feet it's like what uh, you cannot edit a single comma you cannot edit out a, a single full stop comma is i know you can't wait for the next episode to talk about yeah. That. <laughs> yeah so he picks up yeah they along picks up the baton yeah. that was uh, in a way uh, she or window was carry yeah uh, and you know take the same uh, processes mm. the same modes of thought mm. that were created during the uh, start of hindu renaissance mm. and add a lot more to it. Uh, speaking about the direct uh, connection yeah. actually there is a very direct sadhana connection she aurobindo uh, inspired she anirwar mm. who was a great sadhak mm. uh, in that parampara mm. and uh, in a way he was his shishya mm. and uh, Sri Ram Swarup ji was a shishya was a disciple of Sri Anirban and if you see the uh, introduction to uh, some of his books see uh, inner yoga uh, is the introduction to uh, Sri Ram Swarup ji's works and inner yoga talks about the philosophy the darshan of uh, Sri Anirban which is if you read it uh, there is not much deviance from what Sri Aurobindo says e. and suddenly the contemporary reading is e. because when you read Sri Aurobindo because he came from that classical uh, yes. time yes. british time he was speaking to the global audience at that time to that, that global audience yes. suddenly it changes to Sri Aurobindo yes. who is speaking to an audience which is very indian and which is almost independent in, uh, uh, he, he wrote mostly he wrote mostly in bengali but uh, even in translation you can sense that he is talking in idioms because yes. idioms are not talking just about language yes. in idioms of thoughts yes. cultural vocabulary that he is speaking the modes of thoughts that he is speaking in which are very contemporary yeah so he is the disciple in a way of uh, sri arvindo ramsha ramsha ruk ji is directly initiated by sri anirvan in his parampara yes. and sita ram ji is initiated by sri ram so this is how the grace of the guru guru shishya parampara flows this is how tradition flows through uh, sri arvindo then sri anirvan then sri ram ruk ji and sri sita ram ji and it is these two because they were uh, similar in ages although sri ram swarup was of course sri sita ram ji considered him a guru mm. because he was much uh, deeper in sadhana mm. uh, but they were contemporary mm. age uh, there was just uh, uh, an each gap of one year they were creative the, collaborators creative you know, collab- yes. and in a way actually conrad elves uh, dr elves mm. also says that it's impossible to talk about the uh, one without talking about that because their their histories uh their cultural ideological endeavor uh, is, is spiritual endeavor is actually one and yeah. so these are the people who pick up that baton mm. and rekindle intellectually and spiritually in that sense mm. spiritually within the intellectual sphere mm. within the sphere of uh, in- intellectuals and intelligence here they uh, reinfuse it with a spiritual core mm. which was always the hindu hallmark mm. that we never talked about ideas mm. without talking about sad Yeah. that we never gave theories yeah. without giving a practice yeah. that we never talked about just ideas yeah. without saying that how they can be manifested yeah. at a level we never talked about purush without talking about yeah. prakriti and so this is what uh, shri ram swarup ji uh, yeah. uh, does that he introduces that spiritual core once again to uh, the uh, intellectual and uh, conversation about the bharat version all of its power and when you look at this and and this is another dimension that uh, evolves when you start thinking about civilization about your own uh, position in life it is mystical yeah right? you it cannot is. you cannot take away the mystical there is no other it there is no other explanation you have to have a sense of wonder for that mystic yeah. and uh, you will know that once once you're uh, convinced about that you also feel secure intellectually yeah it actually helps your intellectual person yeah. because you are free yeah uh from the uh from the need for an urgent reaction yeah. to what you think the world should do to your ideas right so that i think is is a great uh, personal just as uh, as somebody who's looking to build your own personality looking to build your own intellectual uh, repertoire it's a very important thing to factor that it's the mystical that secures and anchors everything else yeah. otherwise it's more fundamental it is more fundamental you know the question that everyone asks and uh, most people love to ask is if we were so great how did we fall the question that we need to be asking is how did we actually thrive yeah. how did we survive yeah. once you 
change the perspective, once you frame a different question, then you have so much gratitude. You have so much gratitude that it is the seeds of that eternal renewal yeah. that were protected that actually allows you to ask this question. So that, I think, is a very, very important thing that uh, as we're tracing the political history, you should never forget that there is a larger mystical force that is guiding all of this. And the history of India cannot be seen any other way. India. It is a history of the mystics yeah. leaning the society, culture and civilization of Bharat Krishna. That is how it is. That is how it always is. Yeah. And just like you said, how you have to, I would like to use a metaphor here, yeah. which is a meme also, correctly, very yeah. uh, popular meme, uh, that you have to change perspective in what survives and not why we fell, but how we survived through all of this. For example, there is this uh, shot of, I don't know how true that is, but at least for the purposes of me, there is a shot of Hiroshima or Nagasaki mm. after the mm. atom bomb had fallen. And there is a single arch of a temple, a Torah, mm. which mm. keeps it standing. Mm. So well, you can look at it as Holocaust mm. and you can look at it as the one element which survived mm. was something signifying their deepest. Mm. So you can look at all the defeats that India had. Yeah. You can look at all the cuts that were made onto our body. Yeah. But then you can look at the fact that we are still here. The soul is still there. The soul is still there. We are debating all of this. Yeah. That how to make uh, uh, Hindu the spiritual Vishwa Guru. Yeah. Because that's the only way to become yeah. a Vishwa Guru. Yeah. So uh, we are debating all of these things. Yeah. That in itself. So how do we trace this? Uh, you now you, we got up until 70s, 80s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 80s and, and immediately after that you alluded to the uh, economic liberalization. And clearly, there's a lot of churn uh, at the intersection of economics, politics, and yeah. culture. Yeah. I think economics starts becoming a bigger force yeah. post 1991. It shapes culture. What we loosely call modernity today is how we understand the India that you and I grew up in. Yeah. Right? It was a post liberalized uh, yeah. India. I think there is a perspective there. Uh, so, uh, just factoring all of this for the purpose of our introductory episode, how do you then explain the moment that we are in? Yeah. Right. We've looked at the uh, spiritual uh, yeah. historical origins. Yeah. We've looked at how the flame was carried through and what were the ice and and how the renewal started in seventies and eighties, yeah. uh, and then the other factors that has influenced. Where are we today? Yeah. Very pertinent question. That exactly repeating where we are yeah. is uh, uh, we talk about the economic liberalization of society and the country, but at the same time, another very deeply, very different movement is going the yeah. movement for Ram Bhim. Yeah. Which is around the same thing. Yeah. Babri Majid just demolished in 93, I guess. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, yeah, 93. Yeah. So, uh, a very different movie, yeah. which is, uh, it has no direct connection to that. Yeah. And in fact, many think that it was uh, antithetical. Uh, antithetical that was going in opposite direction, that why we were liberalizing and yeah. getting all of this uh, capitalist economy and goods and consumerism and, yeah. you know, the good life. And yeah. these people were regressing that they were trying to, instead of building a hospital, yeah. or a toilet they were building a temple yeah. so but then that was the reality that yeah. movement was going yeah. what voice of india did what sri ram Sarupji and uh, sita ramji did was to gather a host of 15 to 20 scholars mm. and create the intellectual spiritual backbone of the ram Bhumi movement mm. even vsp leaders who carried the list of uh, how many temples have been mm. restored and uh, uh, back mm. it was the list which was created by sri sita ramji by studying the uh, prior resources. He created two volumes Hindu temples, what happened to them? Land, yeah. One and two. Yeah. And that he gives all the evidence of what happens. Yeah. And he gives a very, he says it's a tip of an iceberg. No thousand, a list of 2,000 that And he says it's the tip of an iceberg. It's, uh, one of, it's uh, less than 1%. Yeah. So much has been destroyed. I'm just coming up with this. Along with that, they create the entire argument why is there a problem? Yeah. What is the character of prophet monotheism? Yeah. Uh, what is the character of Sanatana Dharma? Yeah. Who are we? Who we are not? Yeah. All of this ideation, yeah. they do it very well and they add, as we will discuss in other episodes, yeah. episodes yeah. that how they did it so differently yeah. uh, and what are the new and very novel elements yeah. that they add to it. Yeah. So they come up with this uh, great uh, intellectual, creating the intellectual background of the society. On the other hand, due to Ram Dharma movement, yeah. Uh, the part which is signified by BJP by, at that time mm. uh, and uh, supported, of course, on ground by San Parva, by the RSS, it gets power mm. gradually. And you can see yeah, the power that was for 15 years in the last 25 30 years. Yes, that's significant. That's significant. Yeah. You can see is after the Rang Dhanu movement, we yeah. have constantly been increasing their power. Yeah. With, it happens with three short um, yeah. of uh, Vajpayee. Yeah. And then in 2014, we all know what happened after that. 
so uh, there is a great shift on political era the old aristocracy of uh, created by uh, jawaharlal nehru and uh, the congress party that is falling down of course it had an expiry date yeah. anything which is created with so many vested interests to protect uh, you know just a sing, uh, single faction it doesn't it yeah. it has to go and so it had an expiry date which uh, came with uh, 80 80s and 90s yeah. after rajiv gandhi you can see yeah. uh, the fall and on the other hand politically another side is going but as we have been discussing there was an element in this political side also which made political even in this side which uh, picked up the flag of culture mm. of bharat version very genuinely so mm. very good intentions with very good intentions there was an element of political preceding uh, the cultural mm. and the civilization mm. and you see that party coming to mm. power mm. and that sort of uh, uh, ideology and mode of uh, thinking coming to power on the other hand we see that hindu mahasabha relegated to comical space the effort by shri uh, swami kapatri ji and there is a very unfortunate uh, uh, rift mm. which happens within mm. the hindu side mm. lg mm. that uh, the path on which the sant parivar goes mm. and the path on which uh, swami kapatri ji and his followers go they become very different from each other. and they should have been well i'm not saying that one should have been subsumed mm. other, but i'm saying that those the traditional and the politically swear mm. tradition which is able to navigate and the so socially connected this uh, they, mm. they should have been socially connected because you know this side knew how to navigate through the new political system yeah that uh, there was a great resolve in this side yeah. when sanpar was said they faced great sacrifice great resolve in saying this is a new system it might not be ours yeah. but we cannot leave it alone yeah. we have to involve ourselves into it and we one day we have to take over that power yeah. that is a great positive for this uh, yeah. actually view which should be there in any any organization or movement who wants to take the reins by such deep natural respect for indians about nationalism yes it is not the european nationalism it, it's not european it's not nation state that period it is not it is yeah. that there is that understanding that you cannot allow it to disintegrate yes this is a sacred land yes and actually we as apple would uh, yeah. he would lambast people in uh, caribbean countries who tried to uh, who tried caribbean nationalism for example all of the trindad and all small countries he said that it is a land without its people yeah they are people without their land and they are some small some few thousand people that's the, the nationalism in that uh, aspect is ridiculous yeah. you may not agree or uh, with him or not in this but he said that with india yeah. nationalism hindu nationalism is the only natural state of being yes you cannot pre- if you are preventing you are doing great violence to the very uh, soul of its salvation and you cannot uh, you cannot do that it has to be indonesian is yeah. right so i think uh, i think that's how we also encapsulated it in the uh, in the schools of thought yeah. that there is a divergence you know uh, after the great convergence there is a divergence in the indian uh, history modern indian history between now uh, uh, in the within the uh, hindu movement itself Uh, and it's split into the cultural nationalists and the political nationalists right i think we see the same split playing out in contemporary discourse whether it's on twitter or uh, all the other areas where yeah. uh, people and ideas speak yeah. uh, i think all of our discourse is imbued with the same vocabulary in you know in new uh, terms uh, so just talk to us a little bit more and also talk to us about the gandhian legacy of uh, karampal ji and others yeah. i think the other strand that came yeah. to influence us yeah. right. so if you could bring this thing together for us yeah. right So like we were discussing that uh, there is there are two sides if you would talk just like you mentioned there is side of political traditions yeah and what i would like to say is there there is that side of cultural traditions yeah. so with sang parwar and the affiliate organization you yeah. can say a political traditions yeah. who those who are hankering after power because they say there cannot be a power vacuum yeah. if we don't take it somebody else will so better us than them yeah. and so uh, through their work constant work and through also many accidents of history they came to power yeah they came to rule as they are ruling now yeah and then there is another side which is uh, which we were talking about the unfortunate rift uh, mm. between this side of political traditionalists mm. and other side represented by swami karpatri ji mm. and his side of traditionalists mm. these are the people who said that our ancient core has to be reestablished mm. and uh, we cannot in the same social in the same socialist mm. so uh, and they say that that system was perfect which is in which they are entirely true mm. that when it worked mm. it was entirely perfect it was the best system that you can imagine for a society mm. and uh, they uh, hanker after and they want to recreate that society so that is their uh, mm. point of view 
it's not very clear exactly how to do that. Mm. By reasserting in their writings also, it's not exactly clear how to do it, mm. but they are very clear that that has to be done. Mm. Whether that exactly should be mm. the goal of uh, Hindu society going forward or not is a matter of debate. Mm. But the point which is important is that mm. if we completely ignore that side and what they argue, then you miss out a lot on especially in a globally economically liberalized world. Liberalized world. Yeah. Where global forces which are not Indic, yeah. which are anti Indic, anti Hindu in many deeply yeah. uh, fundamental ways, yeah. they will take over you, your institutions, your individuals. Yeah. If you do not pay attention the attention to what these cultural traditionalists had to say, yeah. that there was a reason the Sanatan society, Hindu society, was organized in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, that it paid attention towards ecology, it yeah. paid attention toward uh, sustainability, some of the few buzzwords yeah. that we talk about these days. Yeah. And uh, there was a deep, inherent yeah. cosmic wisdom yeah. in those institutions, in that mode and way of thinking. Yeah. And uh, just blind aping of any structure, whether it be the constitution of Britain yeah. or the capitalist structure of the West, yeah. is dangerous for a society. Yeah. And Utterly stupid for a civilization which is so deep and the ancient most, which most number of ideas, yeah. most elaborate systems imagined yeah. anywhere yeah. in the history of humankind. Yeah. So if you ignore that side yeah. and their arguments, yeah. how practical they are, it's a matter of debate. Yeah. How it can be done, it's a matter of debate. Yeah. But if you ignore that side, you miss out on uh, all the fundamental core yeah. that our Hindu civilization is. Yeah. And the danger is that... Yeah. Uh, you can become the other yeah. by not being careful, yeah. uh, knowing who you are, yeah. by not having a clear swayambo. Movement for action yes. and cause for consequence. And, yeah. and that is it. And this is particularly important even as an individual looking to learn and assemble all these ideas in your mind. Right? Uh, and this is personally for me as well. Uh, it is this predicament, the lack of a respectful dialogue yeah. between two people, yeah. you know, two uh, yeah sides of the same coin yeah. uh, is what I believe has led me to frame my own journey in this as a knowledge systems. Yes. That the, the discourse has to move not uh, in the direction of what is the exact social structure or what is the political institution, yeah. but it has to be one level, two levels above in the context of knowledge systems. And hopefully in the, you know, in the next episodes, we'll also bring the idea of knowledge systems into yeah. this. But what we see is that there is not enough space for a binding glue. Yeah. And you see that this, you know, this vocabulary is getting more and more siloed. Yeah. Right? It's actually a fluke of history. Uh, <laughs> a very stray incident, yeah. very casual uh, incident in which uh, there is a falling out, political falling out of individual personalities yeah. uh, with uh, yeah. Ram Raj Parishad and Sankh yeah. Parwar on the other hand, yeah. which leads to a rift which has become so wide now yeah. that uh, now the debate, and it's actually a good thing that for the first time in a very long time, the debate is within the Hindu side. Yeah, it is. We are no longer debating whether the left is right or not. Yeah. yeah. We are debating which or side is regularism. Or, or regularism. Yeah. Or regularism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those ideas are in the moment and within the great political there is a discussions. Substantial consciousness now. Consciousness now. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a consensus that those sides are wrong. Yeah. But within the Hindu side, there is a debate. Correct. So from here, there you can go to different ways. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is certainly a very positive thing that uh, we are within the Hindu side, that yeah. the debate is, is within the Hindu community. Yeah. But there is also the way if uh, the debate becomes too bitter yeah. and without creating, without uh, sustainable institutions and ideas, yeah. then it uh, that energy is uh, fizzles out and once again a militant minority, another idea and ideology yeah. uh, can take over your uh, system. So it's very important that a healthy dialogue between the two sides. Yeah. What now, I would not like to use those words, but the political Hindus and the traditionalists, yeah. what they are called as tribes, yeah. the traditionalists on one side and political Hindus on the other side, yeah. they have to come together. Not I'm not uh, talking of an, a political coming, a friendship or uh, yeah. you know, physical coming together somewhere, creating a common agenda or sort that yeah. sort of political thing. But I'm saying there are ideas that they both have, which are extremely necessary, yeah. which have to come to a single state. Yeah. And actually here, the wisdom of Sri Sita Ramji, yeah. Uh, yeah. another great yeah. uh, Rishi of uh, yeah. contemporary times comes to the fore. Yeah. If you think about Voice of Indian, what he did, yeah. 
on one hand he created great chaturbhuj by his own writing mm. he created listed out the five enemies of hindu society he told us that hindu society is under siege that yeah. we have to defend it and from what enemies and what is the nature and character so how that. language is hijacked language is hijacked right. how it's, yeah. is hijacked is perverted and how to get it back yeah. so on one hand he did that yeah. on another great and he himself in yeah. man, in defense of hindu society and shri ram sarup ji and many others like uh, shri wangdev shastri yeah created the sense of who we are yeah the we are able to identify yeah, yeah to get our identity so there was a great movement within voice of india of swayambhut yeah. there was a great uh, uh, faction of shatrubhut yeah. and they were doing both of that uh, yeah. very well yeah. along with that see the wisdom of shri sita ram ji was a great leader in that sense he would uh, choose one good thing which a personal or institution would carry yeah. or can contribute yeah. and he would collate them together yeah. and create a great so he himself was a very different kind of author yeah. so he said that uh, uh if you keep defending you lose yeah. so you have to attack the other side and yeah. that's intellectually he said yeah. and that's what he did with his uh, yeah. all of his literature yeah. on the other hand he says that you also have to pay uh, attention towards the constructive side yeah. towards the same both side yeah. and he republishes a lot lots of works of uh, shri dharampal ji yeah. shri dharampal ji was a great gandhian yeah. and uh, uh, he continued the uh, research in vernacular cultures yeah. uh, local regional solutions yeah. which uh, in a way is the third way except uh, yeah very well, desia uh, yeah. desia yeah and um, effort yeah uh, an element which skirts away from communism of course yeah and also from capitalism yeah so uh, he focused on that what were what was our education system yeah. what was our health system yeah. and just doc- kept documenting what we were yeah. until the british came and institutionally destroyed a lot of our yeah. uh, structures yeah. from within yeah so uh, he not just supported and recommended tarampal he republished them through voice of india yeah. distributed and that is the intellectual flexibility you need you and humility yeah. that you need yeah right? in especially in a civilization like bharatiya yeah. which has to be That's changed by to bharatiya that is true bharatiya and this is not where the story ends actually it's it gets even more interesting a lot of uh, uh, traditionalists uh, uh, they uh, actually think little of sita ram ji and also yeah. start saying it uh, uh, ki he uh, he just criticized the enemy and did not do much actually they don't know that uh, in intellectual arena mm. the representation of swami karpatri ji was done by uh, the great dr ak saran mm. uh, about whom not many people know mm. uh, much about it we have a movie yeah one of our uh, thinkers to one of our yeah. thinkers to yeah. pay attention to very yeah. important and uh, he is followed by siddh society mm. uh, they do some workshops and they do some thinking on that mm. uh, there is a small minority mm. uh, a very small intellectual minority mm. which pays attention otherwise he is not very well mm. they don't know that it was sita ram ji who went to varanasi sarnath mm. the buddhist organization which published the works of dr ak sarnath which were not getting sold at all mm. he bought the rights selling rights mm. he bought all those books placed them in voice of india and actually now it is aditya prakashan which is the uh, main publisher uh, publisher of uh, after voice of india another publication of mm. sita ram ji was aditya prakashan which actually publishes and sells ak sarnath ji ak sarnath so the third element of deeply cultural traditionalist actually the intellectual representation of swami karpatri ji yeah. was also recommended by sita ram ji in his work and through his efforts we get to read what dr ak sarnath said that is exactly what we mean by civilizational leadership yeah very sharp intellect a yeah. very productive purpose yeah the ability to blend that with strategy yeah and the outlook to include all dimensions i think this is this is such a you have a template for how to approach civilization yeah So this is great. So I think uh, we've traced the evolution of the uh, Hindu movement uh, in the last 150 years to the way we look at it. At least I'm sure there are a lot of gaps, and that's inevitable when you're looking at mm-hmm. something as big as that and as complex as that. Uh, but I'd like to end by bringing it back to what you started with. You said it has to be interesting to me. Right? That is not an ideologue speaking. That is an artist speaking. Right? That is an aesthetic speaking. And in the civilizational pursuit as well, beauty. has a prominence because it's very easy to get lost in the anger yeah. and anger is uh, seductive yeah. right but anger uh, consumes you and you don't last it is the beauty that endures so you know one of the schools that uh, you know we've been talking about and i know that you've done deep research on that is uh, anand kumar swami ji yeah, and your entire effort on the other side the other side of pankaj saxena yeah. and swarnanjali and for those who see you write about temples and that uh so let us let us also uh, make the picture complete 
yes you need the spiritual wisdom you need the political understanding yeah. you need the social uh, understanding you need the cultural understanding but there is an artistic element to civilization yeah. that actually makes everything else possible so tell us how does one look at arun kumar swami ji in this and make it complete for us yeah actually it is as if you read my mind while yeah, going yeah. through that uh, how do we yeah. bring it together back uh, just like we started like you said that uh, it has to be interesting to me mm-hmm. so when i was going what was the main thrust when i look back of course at that time i was not uh, thinking in these yeah. uh, you know sophisticated words and terminology yeah. of course yes. uh, i didn't have the means yeah. uh, but when i look back yeah. what was the experiential part mm-hmm. what was the inspiration at that time i just wanted to know mm. there was a very deep very ever since i started reading at 9 or 10 mm. just one desire to know mm. and that was not something additional to that mm. that was not something that you would do after you eat mm. after you live in a comfortable mm. home after you wear good clothes mm. that was so fundamental mm. that i could never imagine my life away from mm. it and i had to know i had to constantly know mm. why i had to know when i thought about it mm. because the world had to make sense to me mm. it was actually a meaning making process mm. uh it could be just arbitrary mm. the all the life mm. all the death mm. around me mm. all the pain all the suffering all the pleasure mm. around me all the why are you so on where you are where, yes all of these questions mm. it all had to make sense mm. it all had to come together all the disciplines that i was studying it was not just random i mean i of course i was discovering them at random mm. i was reading whatever because it was a pre internet era mm. you didn't have any pull whatever was pushed on you you had to read but in all that there was an urge to make sense of the world mm. by drawing analogies from one discipline to another mm. from understanding how the world is and at the same time it had to give deep pleasure to mm. it had to be extremely beautiful mm. so when you look back you see that beauty and truth at that time the search for meaning and truth and the search for beauty mm. were not two different quests they are same they are same they were one and this is where the vision of anand kumar swami comes and uh, uh just to mention a fact that dr ak saran was a great uh, disciple of uh, mm-hmm. anand kumar swami ji he worked with uh, his wife also after mm-hmm. the passing away of kumar swami and uh, the vision of kumar swami actually i have understood hindu darshan mm-hmm. not directly by reading darshan at first mm-hmm. i understood hindu darshan at first time very deeply by reading the work of kumar swami because he uses it he looks at the manifestation yeah the same sacred vocabulary yeah. which is propounded in the deepest of our texts yeah. the same sacred vocabulary when it works its way through every single hindu discipline yeah and manifest in extremely vivid different and yet in spirit the same disciplines he looks at those at that manifestation he looks at those disciplines yeah. and he backtracks and back constructs the same things yeah. so it is the vision of kumar swami the search for beauty in life yeah. which can absolve me yeah. of all the attendant pains yeah. life has to be with pains yeah there is no life yeah. this is sansara it is dual yeah. it will always be dual yeah jagat dvatatmak hi hai yeah. uh, and it has to be like that always yeah. but how do you absorb your how you are it yeah. how, how do you harmonize you, there will be hardship there will be pain you cannot run away from pain yeah. how do you move above from it? Yeah. which is the lens of beauty yeah. that even in the worst of your times yeah. even when there is the life is so bad everything around you is, is so bad yeah. and yet if you are able to find one single thing e which is beautiful e it is enough to carry you out e until the world becomes more beautiful for you in e so that is a vision that kumar swami says he uh, represents e he and in very beautiful ways he says that i say nothing which is novel which is seen i am just essentially you are quite essentially in dubai yeah. yeah all the few reading i still am to find another <coughs> author like him yeah uh, with his style and yeah. that sort of vision that searing beauty and uh, insight and yet he says that i am saying nothing new yeah. and uh, i am just repeating i can quote a scripture after a scripture of what i have said yeah. it is the same i am just reinstating the same truths yeah. and so he brings in entire hindu darshan looks at it by looking at manifestations in art aesthetics vastu shilp uh, chitrakala mm. natya natya sangeet all of these uh, uh, disciplines he looks at and he says the same principle and the, that another side mm. is extremely necessary yeah. to put the political and the civilization in perspective yeah. Yeah. because at the end of the day mm. and rather i would say at the beginning of a day yeah. in the morning at sunrise <laughs> at sunrise there is no reason to be unhappy yeah if you wake up yeah. there is still sunlight yeah. 
you can still see sun rays. You have no reason to be unhappy. Yeah. If you see flowers that bloom, yeah. there is no reason to be unhappy. Yeah. If there is an old breeze that blows, yeah. if you have good food, good conversation, yeah. if you have that sort of small happinesses in life, yeah. Yeah. things like this, yeah. things more most fundamental yeah. to living a good life are in place, yeah. there is no reason to be unhappy. Yeah. And so while doing all of this, while going through all the churns, political, very painful chapters of our history, yeah. civilization and politics, yeah. There is no excuse to Hindu yeah. to wake up in the morning and be unhappy and morose. You we cannot be, be a Hindu and be unhappy. Be unhappy. I, I, just because you're in the civilizational discourse. This course doesn't mean you have to be. No, you can't. Yeah. Knowledge in that sense is not asymptomatic. Yeah. If you learn a Hindu discipline, yeah. you will your behavior will change. And it will change to become better. Yeah. You will become a happier person. Yeah. And that is the crux that comes on. And that is the fundamental response. To do all of this work, but uh, you know, from the point of view, being rooted, okay. uh, from the point of view of being yeah. uh, you know, pursuing your happiness. Yeah. Great. So uh, we've come here. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll explore uh, each of these thinkers in detail in our subsequent episodes. Yeah. And uh, through that, we hope to, like I said, evoke a conversation yeah. and have a dialogue. And, and uh, let's see where it goes. Yeah. Thanks. Good time. <laughs>